for those of you who aren't familiar with partners, we're a large hospital system across Eastern Massachusetts, uh, primarily. You know, we have a site in Western Mass. We have a hospital in New Hampshire as well. We have two big academic medical centers. We have a specialty hospital for behavioral health and then um, some post-acute hospitals as well uh, where we offer rehab, LTAC and SNF uh, services. We're all on one instance of EPIC and all of these sites here leverage our core inpatient nursing build in one way or another. And so my role as the clinical informatics lead um, for nursing is I'm the liaison um, between the nursing informatics leaders at these hospitals and the application teams and analysts who support our EPIC build. And what I do um, every day is really to drive consensus at an enterprise level for the clinical content within the system and um, the electronic workflows that the system supports. So what our challenge was ahead of us as we came into this COVID pandemic is we knew we had a documentation burden um, that our nurses were facing. This was actually a project that we were planning to kick off. Um, we were getting ready to roll out a survey to staff to guide where our interventions would be in attacking this problem and had to put it on hold um, because of COVID. With that, the, the inpatient population was changing. We had an increase in patient acuity. Um, they had very unique needs. And we were also faced with staffing changes. Um, staff were floating from different areas. Um, we had potentials for changes in nurse to patient ratios. Um, and we needed a quick solution so nurses could spend time with their patients and not at the computer. So the challenge ahead of us was, how do we support staff so they can focus their day on caring for their patients? So um, we discussed this problem and um, our solutions at our Nursing Informatics Advisory Committee. And this is the highest level of um, governance for nursing informatics and decisions at partners. We have a nursing informatics leader from each hospital that joins, as well as representation from um, all, of our, all of the nurses on our clinical informatics team at Partners eCare. We also have leadership from our application teams. And this group has been um, a very cohesive and effective group since before our first EPIC Go Live. I think we've been together um, since about 2014. So we really, um, you know, stormed and formed and have a really good process of hearing each other out and really making good um, decisions for the enterprise. So as we looked at the work ahead of us in decreasing the burden of documentation, there's really you know, two ways you can look at it. Um, first is the operational. What are the local policies and procedures? Um, you know, how will the units and hospitals have a policy of reduced documentation? That wasn't something that we at the partners eCare side, um, those who, who build and maintain EPIC were, were really um, going to be too active in, but it certainly needed to be part of the conversation. We with, EP, with our um, NIAC group, we're really gonna focus on what are the technical changes that we can make to guide users to what they should be documenting during this crisis and how can we decrease the burden for them? So what guided our technical changes um, were many different inputs. Um, we looked at what Vanderbilt had done. They started a framework um, pretty early in this COVID pandemic and actually shared it with our vendor, Epic. Um, we also looked at what our vendor was recommending um, for changes because they were rapidly producing um, and showcasing in their foundation environment um, build to help decrease um, 
the burden of documentation and meet other COVID related measures. Um, and we also looked at what, um, you know, CMS was changing during this time. So those formed our disaster build and our disaster build um, took two angles. The first was, you know, how do we reduce automation and reminders and without really removing content? And then how do we streamline um, the input process? So we created a navigator to guide essential documentation. So we'll go through this in more detail. So this um, was taken from um, Vanderbilt. This is what they shared um, with Epic, and this was shared um, with nursing leaders, um, you know, who are on Epic's distribution list. Um, this goes through uh, various phases of care. It does include a lot of operational recommendations for when and what should be documented. Um, documenting by exceptions or when patient presentation warrants. But there are things in here um, that we were able to pull out and say, we technically can support this um, from, our, from our build. And that's really what we focused on. Um, what the vendor um, had pushed forward for us was a disaster admission navigator, a disaster shift navigator, and then a way to um, kind of turn off some of the required documentation or reduce it. They, I mean, they offered a lot of things related to COVID, but these are the specifics um, for this topic that we're discussing tonight. And then CMS, um, right around this time, moved forward with putting patients over paperwork and waived their pro, uh, provision for nursing to keep a current um, care plan for every patient, really allowing nurses to spend more time meeting patient clinical needs and spend time with the patient. So um, our technical changes were focused on reducing automation and reminders for what we had considered to be non-essential documentation during this time, and another effort to drive users to a streamlined documentation tool to capture that essential. The goals of these changes, we wanted something that was going to be easy for us to build and move to production because we didn't have um, weeks or months to design, test, um, and deploy. We really needed something um, to deploy rapidly and we needed something that would give us a lot of bang for our buck. On the other side, we needed something that when this was all over, we wouldn't need to spend months on building, that we could easily back this out. We wanted something that was gonna be intuitive for staff as well. So not only um, for the staff who normally work, um, you know, in the inpatient areas, but for staff who would be coming from other areas and, you know, they're learning the inpatient tools and on top of that, the inpatient tools may be changing. So we really wanted to make it, um, you know, as easy on the end user to learn and absorb and use. We wanted to maintain our current tools to do this. And so, um, you know, we had heard introducing new tools at this time may be confusing for both those staff um, who work in, you know, in the ICUs or on the med surge floors who will be supporting staff floating in from other areas. So not a, not a time to increase to introduce something new. We wanted to keep the organization of the content and how it looked visually consistent with what they're um, used to seeing in the current um, user interfaces. And we wanted things to be universal so that they really made sense across all inpatient applications. Because as I'll get to a little bit later, um, this build does touch more than just you know, our inpatient med surge units and our ICUs. Um, there were a few changes that we entertained that we did not move forward with because they didn't meet these um, 
these goals. The shift navigator, for example, that um, Epic had um, built and proposed in their foundation environment was really much different than our current state shift navigator. And we also heard staff aren't really going to it. So to build something and hope they'd go to it that was different just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, and we similarly, similarly had a request for a flow sheet that really introduced too many changes and we decided not to implement at this time. So the principles of the changes that, that we were embarking on, we wanted to remove the burden from nursing on shared elements. Um, so there are some things um, in the record, you know, smoking history, for example, that are not just part of the nursing build, but they're, um, you know, in the providers' workflows as well um, and other clinicians. So we wanted to remove that reminder to nursing. We didn't actually remove any build. Um, as we did these changes, we just uh, removed those reminders and, and drove people um, to the right place for this consolidated documentation. Um, again, we, we removed, I'll say, the reminders for things that we, we said this isn't pertinent to document during a crisis, um, and also things that wouldn't impact the care outcome. And I think you know, later as we, we look at our system when this is all over and, and look at our project of decreasing the burden of documentation, we'll have learned some lessons. Some of these things we may say, why, why do we have it there anyway? You know, I think that's what we've heard in other presentations when people um, look at decreasing the burden of documentation. Um, we need to have a reason why we're collecting it. We wanted to keep assessments um, for populations that may be vulnerable, where things may be exacerbated during a crisis. Um, so things like audit C, um, suicide assessments, domestic and intimate partner abuse assessments. We said we, we absolutely need to keep these things. Um, and we wanted to keep assessments that um, fed into any kind of decision support or upstream um, information collection for services that are still supported during this time, um, like social work. Social work is uh, in spiritual care. They're still continuing to see patients. Um, so we weren't going to remove those elements. And then lastly, is this applicable across all of the populations supported by the inpatient build? So for the first of our technical changes, I have here um, what we removed for our reminders on our admission required documentation. Um, these all align with the goals that I had stated um, previously. It wasn't always a black and white, um, you know, yes or no with those principles. It, it was really a, a discussion um, through our NIAC group and through a few iterations of, you know, some of these we had moved back and forth. Yes, we should include them. No, we shouldn't. And we looked at things like um, documentation trends. We have um, access to a, a Tableau dashboard that shows us who's documenting on fields, how often, what, you know, what the most common responses are and such. And so we, we leveraged that as well as um, conversations with sites of how impactful would it be to case management, for it, um, example, if we removed the required documentation for discharge planning. Um, so we had a lot of conversations around um, what we should keep, what we should remove for those reminders, and how it would impact um, the trajectory of the patient. Um, and then with that, we have a few elements that are required on a regular basis after admission. For many hospitals, they're required every shift, like um, our skin, our pressure injury risk assessment and fall risk assessments. And we decided to make those um, required um, every day rather than every shift. 
Um, so secondly, to go with that, we created a disaster admission navigator. Um, this became the default within the navigators activity for our um, kind of med surge and ICU um, areas. It's set up to really support the essential admission workflows and information that needs to be collected. And the content aligns with um, what we did for the required doc, with what we decided to keep versus remove. So this really supports what we're keeping. And then within some of these sections, we condensed um, and removed some flow sheet rows that really didn't meet those um, principles and goals of um, collecting information that would support outcomes. Um, so we cut it probably almost in half. Um, there's a lot of scrolling in the regular admission navigator, but we, we didn't remove anything. As I said earlier, um, the admission navigator is right next to it. And if an area was not um, faced with a surge, had stable staffing and locally um, wasn't at a point where they needed to implement this, um, they had their regular tools still available. Um, so, the, the last big thing that we did that um, actually didn't come from um, really anyone other than us, and then it was supported um, by CMS's changes at that time, um, was decreasing some of the automation. Um, so we in our system today have or, or had the first dose patient education functionality turned on for a subset of medications. Um, and that functionality adds an education point to the education activity and also um, in a sidebar available from the MAR, reminding the nurse to document um, education to the patient when a medication is considered new to them. Um, we also have a handful, and I think we're about maybe 14 or 15 best practice advisories that recommend a plan of care um, template based on documentation um, or orders. So, you know, patients high risk for um, VTE or um, CLABC, et cetera, um, we trigger a best practice advisory recommending that the nurse add that plan of care and customize it. And so while, you know, patient ed and plan of care are really great tools to um, track patients' progress over the course of the admission, the data is really documented very discreetly and does require a, a lot of clicks and a lot of time documenting. Um, so we decided that we were going to turn off this automation and give staff a, a, a reprieve from having to document to this level of detail. And so while turning that automation off, we added text um, to our nursing progress notes um, that served as kind of an attestation that the plan of care um, was reviewed with the patient or family, the patient was educated, and it provided space for staff to add any additional details um, as warranted. Um, we've actually made an update to it since pushing this out um, to production because it was a little bit focused on the day shift and this was populating for all um, progress notes, even overnight. So we, we've modified the language a little bit there. So it's more uh, general use. So all those changes um, that I just described are part of our um, inpatient nursing build. And our inpatient nursing build is kind of weaved into all of these domains. So it's not just um, general care and ICU, but our behavioral health um, units use this. Same with the OB, newborn, NICU, pediatric, and our post-acutes. Um, so there was really a lot of variability in the configuration and how it would be observed in these domains. So that's really where we needed to be very mindful about how we implemented and operationalized it. So this table is a little bit busy, 
but it's really meant to give you a high level overview of the variability of um, how that build was translated into these different care areas by the way our system is built and organized. So, you know, some areas really needed to do additional communication and implementation strategies as we made this build available in production. Um, so, you know, OB, newborn, NICU, um, for example, they weren't going to be getting plan of care, um, best practice advisories, um, but they may not be observing this COVID crisis in the same way. They may have um, stable staffing and may not be feeling the crunch, or they may be, um, we don't know, um, you know, at a central level, but really this was to be mindful as um, sites evaluated these changes as we were planning them, what the communication um, strategies would need to be locally at those levels. What would the expectation be from staff on, um, you know, would they continue to use the plan of care without the reminders? So as we got ready um, to push this out into production, we did uh, three iterations um, that were reviewed with our Nursing Informatics Advisory Committee um, and really relied on a lot of back and forth um, with them to talk to staff um, locally about how these changes would impact them. And not just nursing staff, but as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, some of our other colleagues that, that we work with who use, you know, information that nursing documents. They also helped us get input from their quality leaders. We did um, get endorsement from our CNO council to move forward with this and they were great. They were pretty much gave us the green light and said, do what you need to do and we fully support you. Um, you know, decreasing the burden of documentation for nurses during this time. Um, so this did go through our, our standard change management process um, where this is communicated to, um, you know, various nursing groups, various site support groups. Um, it goes through, you know, a formal communication pro uh, process. And then we offered, um, you know, a, from a partner's eCare perspective, a release note that outlined the changes. Um, it went with it. It did move in an off scheduled date because um, we typically move things every month, but during COVID, um, you know, we really needed to rapidly respond to um, users and sites needs. So um, I think it was maybe about two or three days after we did our final review, teed everything up and said, okay, are you, you're ready to move. Um, so we gave sites a few days to have all the material in hand, um, you know, review it in some of the environments with some of their users and get ready for that. Uh, so as I alluded to a little bit earlier, um, some of the operational challenges and considerations were really around this um, concept of a, a core nursing build that we were changing, but how it varied in its impact across domains, across the enterprise. And not only that, but all our hospitals and units were experiencing a different degree of this COVID crisis. We weren't all at the same place at the same time. So um, locally, hospitals, units really needed to um, have a strategic plan of how they were going to instruct users to interact with the system, to document, as these technical changes were introduced and also be prepared for that to change as as COVID you know surged. So at the local level there was really needed to be a lot of flexibility and um, continued assessment and um, kind of refocus of, of efforts as things changed. Um, another thing that we had to consider was 
don't, you know, we turned off our plan of care and patient education automation, but we, at the time we did that, we had patients who were admitted um, who had some of these things in progress. Some patients, um, you know, weren't, or, or staff weren't impacted by this surge and others were. So um, again, conversations really at the local um, hospital and unit level about what the expectations were for staff um, to either resolve those problems um, or to continue to document against them. And lastly, um, I wanted to stress that the changes that we made during this COVID crisis were really focused on the staff in the facility caring for those patients and not necessarily tools to just be used for patients who have that COVID diagnosis. And that, that took, um, you know, a few, in the beginning, it was like, you know, a little bit of something that we needed to clear up. And so what I think we've gained from this journey is it's really going to inform us when this is settled and we look back and say, how did we do with this um, smaller data set of information and how did we care for our patients? What's really essential and what's not? And, and what can we learn from that? Um, we also really learned how to rapidly deploy an innovative change. It was, it's been amazing to see um, really everyone come together and just get the work done in a very innovative manner, in a very effective manner, and really everyone supporting each other. Um, I think we've also learned that it's important to maintain our tools, but to change the content within them. And that's, a, that's less interruptive to end users and easier for them to um, adapt. And then lastly, um, we heard accolades of, you know, relief from end users and satisfaction with um, pushing this model out to them. So that's, that's it. And I'm open to take um, questions, hear feedback, um, and open it up to you. Could you talk about training? Because we had some questions about how this was rolled, off, rolled out. You talked about all the different facilities that you support. And can you talk about how the training and communication was managed? So, so Mary, if I can speak to this, this is Diane. So what was so brilliant about um, this whole plan to reduce was um, Christine and her team did work within our regular um, framework. And so this was one of the easier rollouts um, to do education with the nurses because, first of all, what was amazing is in my many years in informatics of sending out you know multiple messages and emails and making posters and and then going out to nurses and having them say well how come i didn't know about this my tagline on this was reduced documentation and then i went out the day that the change got made and so many nurses had read the communication because they're dying for reduced documentation. So that was, so stop saying, you know, that there's gonna be an upgrade. You know, we've gotta say what, what is the key and hopefully if it's actually something beneficial to nursing, they'll read it. But, um, but because they had the framework there, it was just like putting a big red X through what they didn't have to do anymore. And, you know, every nurse is stressed right now if they're on the front line. So to take something off their plate was it was just such a gift our nurses are still um, when i go out on the floors they're just like you have done so much by taking something off of our plate now so they they're still thanking you christine so oh that's great to hear <laughs> right i was on i was out on the units today and and still heard accolades from nurses how much they really appreciate it so thank you we have been kind of wringing our hands at trying to reduce the burden of work um, and not knowing exactly where I feel like, um, and I've actually had nurses ask me, you know, is this going to help lead the way to that? And, um, you know, I was. I, yeah, I think it is. I, I hope that we're all feeling fresh when we're ready to take that on. We need to strategize, right? How are we going to turn this off? 
and not hit them with uh, with a ton of documentation yeah. again and how do we rapidly um you know try to decrease documentation in a meaningful way in the right way or have you thought about the question that you know do you need to remove it <laughs> right i, um, I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> we need to ask do we need to bring this back is there any way that you could tie this decreased documentation to i mean obviously if you're dealing with covid patients it's kind of a different scenario but is there, do you have any benchmarks that you could compare it to that would show that basically the effect was no, or even, you know, or improved outcomes? I don't know that I have outcome data. We have a lot of other data that we, that we could use, um, but not so nicely associated with outcomes, unfortunately. Hmm. But, you know, I, we, we do have data and we try to use it when we can. Um, so we've, we've been fortunate in that regard. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out this evening to come together. And uh, we hope this was really, a, I know, I know it was valuable, but I hope that we can just continue to support each other in this way. So thank you very much and a special, special thanks uh, to Diane Manasco for recommending Christine and for Christine for putting this presentation together. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice evening.